Okay, questions? Okay, so yesterday we ended off, we ended with reactions of carboxylic acids, and so the final reaction that we ended with was if you take a carboxylic acid and you add to it two equivalents of a Grignard and Grignard and, organo and organolithium are equivalent. So if we add two equivalents of a Grignard to a carboxylic acid, what is the final product that we get? Ultimately, we will make a hydrate, but then that hydrate's going to form something else. A ketone. So, we're going to end up with a ketone as our final product, and the question is then, what groups are attached to the carbonyl? So the CH3 will be one group, and then what will be the other group? That's got to be the cyclohexane. So one, one R group comes from the carboxylic acid, and then the other comes from the Grignard or organometallic that we used. So there's going to what we did yesterday and, and we'll, let's we can go back and draw the mechanism of this out really quickly. But I think I'm going to need help. So what's the first step going to be in this mechanism? So the cyclohexane anion is going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid, so we're going to make the carboxylate plus the cyclohexane. So we're throwing away one equivalent of our, Grign of our Grignard. And then what's the second step? The second step is to have The second equivalent of anion do what? Attack the carbonyl. So that we're going to make we're going to have a di anion. So we're going to have two O minuses. And once we make this compound I can't do anything else. Maybe those O minuses want to come back down and reform a carbonyl, but they can't because nothing can leave. So then they're just going to hang around and basically be protonated to form with the acid and the water. So usually we add excess acid and water to this, but I'll put the two in just so we know that both OHs then become protonated. So then we end up with our hydrate. And we know run-of-the-mill hydrates are not stable. So what happens next? This is ultimately going to go back to the ketone. But when I showed you this and said, oh, well, you might have to write the mechanism to go back to the ketone, I saw looks of terror, semi-terror, 
And then I said, it's not that bad, and probably nobody believed me. So let's go ahead and write that mechanism. So I'm adding, I added H plus H2O. Tell me what the next step is. I got an H plus, and I got an oxygen species. Okay, and it doesn't matter which one, right? This is going to matter which OH, but I'm going to protonate the oxygen, protonate the OH. Okay, so when I do that, what am I going to end up with? An oxonium ion. So when I add the H plus H2O to convert the alkoxides to OHs, there's excess acid in there to now go ahead and react with one of those OHs. Now there's I'll accept two I'll accept two series of steps here. You can do this in one step if you'd like, or you could do this in two steps. So if I said, what happens next, what would you say? The water can leave so that I can lose H2O I'm going to end up then with carbocation and so now how does that form the ketone? So I'm going to take this pair of electrons, move it here lose H plus to form the ketone. Okay. That, this structure with the C plus with the OH, where do I have space to write this? Here, I'll create a box down here. Now let's draw a straight line. Remember that when we took our carbonyl before and we added H plus to it, that when we protonated the carbonyl, we made this species. We, we protonated the oxygen with the double bond in place. And then what resonance structure could I draw? I could take that pair of electrons and move it there. So the resonance structure would be an OH with a plus charge on the carbon. This, this structure right here is the OH with the C plus next to it. So it's that resonance structure. So if you didn't, if you wanted to write the resonance structure where the carbonyl, this resonance structure where the carbonyl is protonated, you could do that, and then lose the H+. Plus. Now, books will talk about this. They'll say, oh, well, why don't I just move this pair of electrons off the hydrogen and lose the water at the same time, and then just go right to the carbonyl. And so sometimes books will combine those two steps into one. So I'll accept either either one. If you want to lose the water, then lose the H+, plus, or if you want to lose H+, plus, if you want to lose the H+, plus and the H2 all, all in one step, I'll accept that too. I mean, the reality is they do, they do this combined step a lot. Now, I'll talk about it. We'll talk about it because we're, this isn't the... This isn't the last time we're going to do this combined. That we'll do this combined step. So I'll accept either one.
So see, going from the so going from the going from the hydrate here, protonating protonating the OH, losing the water, and then forming the ketone. It's not that bad. At this point, it's tedious. Because when we start doing the reactions of acid derivatives, which is what the theme of today is, it's tedious. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's boring. It's, it's the same thing, just with different compounds. So it's not that bad to go from the hydrate all the way back to the ketone. So is this something I could ask you to do on Monday? Yeah. What's the tricky part? And the tricky part is actually deprotonating the carboxylic acid here in the first step. That's the tricky part. After that, we've done all these steps. Okay, so that, from a synthetic standpoint, if you wanted to make a ketone and you wanted to say, well, I want to make a ketone, then all you'd have to do is say, okay, here's my two groups that I want to add. One group goes on the carboxylic acid, the other group goes on the organometallic reagent. Remembering that the organometallic reagent came from taking that alkyl halide and then either adding magnesium or adding lithium to it. We haven't done as much what's called retrosynthesis or reverse synthesis because we never have time for it. But this is what people have to do. If they want to make that molecule, they've got to sit down and say, okay, all the methods I have to make ketones. And then they choose the one that's best, and then, okay, if I want to make this specific ketone, choose my groups. So this is a fairly easy way to make a ketone. And I have control over what the two groups are going to be. So that that's the last reaction of, well, actually, no, it's not the last reaction. Because now they're, because we're now going to set the stage for the next group. Okay, but does this make sense to everybody? Okay, next. In the book, they, the next step is take a carb take a carboxylic acid and make a acid chloride out of it like this is brand new and so what we would use is SOCl2 or PCl3 Sometimes there's another reagent that people try and use that is not correct. I will not say that one. So we use the reagents whose only job is to convert OH to Cl. And then the question is, so what do I do with acid chlorides? And the two things we've talked about so far to do with acid chlorides is to react them with alcohols and what kind of functional group do I make there? Carboxylic acid chloride plus an alcohol makes an an ester. Plus HCl.
or carboxylic acid chloride plus amine will make and close and mm -hmm. so that makes an amid same type of reaction. So that's two of the reactions that amino that um, carboxylic acid chlorides can do. And there are uh, two others that you can do. So that leads us then, that's the end of chapter 24. Now we're going to move into chapter 25. And chapter 25 now is at carboxylic acid derivatives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and set up the chart that I set up within the last four or five days. I don't quite remember when, if we did this on Monday or if it was last Thursday. Carboxylic acid chloride or acid derivatives are going to be ranked like this. And then remember that nitriles are carboxylic acid derivatives, but they don't fit the form of the first four. So these four structures then, I have ranked according to reactivity. Carboxylic acid chlorides are the most reactive and amides are least reactive. In what kind of reaction? Actually in all kinds of reactions. But in particular, when I take my carboxylic acid derivative, which now I'm going to substitute a Y group for the CL, the OC double bond OR, the OH, the OR, and the nitrogen. I'm going to call that Y. So now when I add a nucleophile to my carbonyl, The nucleophile is going to attack the carbon. We'll go ahead for the sake of argument and make it a negative one, although it doesn't have to be. It could be a, this also could be a neutral nucleophile with H plus. But if a negative nucleophile comes in and attacks the carbonyl, we then form our alkoxide. And if this is a negative charge, what happens? The CO minus tries to reform the carbonyl bond, tries to reform the carbon oxygen double bond. And so when it brings down the pair of electrons, what happens? If it's going to be successful, something has to leak. 
So the competition here is between Y and the nucleophile. If the nucleophile is a better leaving group, what happens? We go backwards. If the Y is a better leaving group than the nucleophile, we go forward and we end up forming what's called acyl substitution. So it all boils down to the Y group versus the nucleophile. Who is the better leaving group? If I want to know who the better leaving group is, I need my chart. What chart? Yeah, a periodic table would be nice. But I just created the chart. In terms of me ranking these groups over here, this being number one down to amid, I've now ranked them and what is that? What is the chloride? What is the OC double bond OR? What is the OH? What is the OR? Those are the Y groups and those are potential leaving groups. And so leaving, oh, I'm going to say this again, leaving group ability is based on one thing. Inversely. Basicity inversely. How many times have I said that? More than five. So who's the best leaving group? Chloride. Who's the next best leaving group? OC double bond OR. Why? Because that's a weak base because it's stabilized by resonance. Right? If I make this my O minus with my C double bond O R, that's a that's a weak base because it's stabilized by resonance. O H minus, if it's gonna leave, it's next. O R minus is a stronger base, so it's below that. And the N minus, now we're on the periodic table, so now we've moved over to N minus. We've got a fairly strong base. Are those just going to leave on their own uh, once? Normally, they're going to need H plus to make them leave. Okay. But that's why I order the group this way. That's why I'm ordering it acid chloride on down to amide. Because the reason why the acid chloride is the most reactive is because chloride is the best leaving group. And so once I make this species right here, no question chloride's leaving. Okay. And we've seen that with the Grignard reaction. Okay. So this sets up the entire chapter 25, I think. And so it's just one reaction after another. So, let's begin. How bad are the mechanisms? They're not that bad. For instance, the difficulty with acid chlorides is, well, they are carboxylic acid derivatives because everything is a carboxylic acid derivative if when you add H plus, water or hydroxide water, you get a carboxylic acid. That's the definition of the derivative. So when you react something with H plus H2O or when you react it with hydroxide H2O, that is called hydrolysis. And so in a hydrolysis reaction, 
you're adding acid and water and you're basically cleaving water. That's what hydrolysis, that's what hydrolysis means, right? So if I take my acid chloride and I react it with either acid or base, I don't need acid or base for this. All I basically need is water. So what's the mechanism of this reaction? What should happen? First step. No acid to protonate. So what's the water going to do? Attack the carbonyl carbon. Anybody concerned about that? I mean, I might be concerned because doesn't it need acid? It needed acid before. Why doesn't it need acid now? I made this carbon even more delta positive than it would be in a normal aldehyde or ketone because what's the chlorine doing? Chlorine's pulling electron density out of that carbon. So now that carbon is more delta positive than it would normally be. And it's just delta positive enough for the water to add. So I'm not that concerned. But now I'm going to end up with this. There's two ways you can go with this mechanism. And I'm not sure which one is correct, although I think I might have a way to figure that out. So first, sometimes books will just say, you know what, I'm going to bring this pair of electrons down. I'm going to kick off the chloride. So I'm going to reform the carbonyl. I'm going to end up with this OH plus species. And then what's going to happen? Lose the H plus to now form the carboxylic acid. And so I lost a chloride. Or the other method or the other reaction would be I've got an O minus and an H2O plus. I've got basically a zwitter ion like I had when I attacked an amine to an, to an aldehyde or ketone. So the other possibility is that this O minus removes that H plus. Again, not intramolecularly, but two molecules come close together because they're both really unstable, so maybe this happens. And now I end up with my OH, my other OH, and my CL. And so now you could say, okay, let's lose H plus and CL minus. So now let's lose H plus CL minus to give me my carboxylic acid. And I think, although I haven't surveyed all of the organic books, but I've seen, I've seen both of these proposed. And maybe the reality is that both of them do occur at the same time. But usually when I do this, that, that first one bothers me, although I'm I suppose I can live with it, particularly if it's in one step less. But I do, in my, I do have in my mind a way to test this. 
I just haven't either done it or convinced a student to, or even talked to a student about doing this. But the way we'd actually tell the difference between these two is actually by getting water where oxygen on the periodic table has, it has uh, two iso it's got three isotopes. It's got 16, 17, and 18. 18 would be the radioactive one. There's not a whole lot of radioactive oxygen in the world. And there's not very much oxygen 17 in the world. So in other words, you could take water and you could separate out the isotopes. Oxygen 16 versus oxygen 17. But in one of my drawers in my lab, I have probably like $3,000 worth of H2O with a oxygen 17 label. It came from a previous professor that I didn't replace but retired shortly after I got here. So it's like 25 years old. And so if I did this reaction with water that was totally oxygen 17, if the first mechanism occurs, I should see incorporation of oxygen 17 completely into my molecule as the OH. So I, the only place I'm going to end up with oxygen 17 is in the OH position. None in the carbonyl. But if the second mechanism occurs, then what's going to happen is that I could lose the H plus from the top carbon or I could lose the H plus from the bottom carbon. So that means in my final product here, I should see oxygen 17 in both places, like 50-50. And so you might say, well, how are you going to tell the difference between those? Uh, mass spec not necessarily helpful because the mass spec of the product is going to have one mass unit higher. Because by making an O16 and O17, I've increased the molecular weight by one. Now, perhaps if I looked at the fragmentation pattern, I might be able to see one fragment higher than the other, and that might tell me about this. But it's probably not going to work all that well. In the, in the NMR, though, you can actually record a, an oxygen 17 spectrum to get a peak. And there is a distinct peak between an OH and a carbonyl. And so those two oxygens would be at different chemical shifts. So that if I analyze the product, I would see one peak or I would see two peaks. And so I would be able to tell the difference between these two species and say, okay, one of these two mechanisms is correct and the other one isn't. Chances are somebody's probably already done this and I just haven't bothered to look up the literature to find it yet. But I do a lot of lab development for like advanced labs and stuff so this would be this would be a mini mechanisms experiment that people could do is if you looked in the books you'd see both of them a curious student might say well which one of those is correct and then you would have to sit down and design a mechanism in the old days oxygen 18 might be used because then you would be able to trace where the radioactive product was and that was done in biosynthetic reactions. So if, you f so if a plant, for instance, takes molecules in and makes this product out of it, and you don't know what the mechanism is, the first step might be to give it like radioactive carbon or radioactive oxygen, isolate the products and see which one were radioactive to know where the carbon that you fed it ended up. But radioactivity is tough to work with. It's a lot of paperwork. So now people do it by mass spec by feeding it isotopes and then figuring out where the isotope went. So this is tedious. Nobody would care about it. But I like that stuff. So, the, so I don't know which one is which. And I think I've talked about this for like the last four years. So 
I haven't gotten a chance to do it. But that's how we could tell the difference. And in your book, they'll actually, when we get to esterification, people did this to figure out how these, the mechanism of esterification. So this is hydrolysis. These are the steps. We're going to do these same steps again and again and again, only instead of kicking off chlorine, we're going to kick off something else. Okay. So this is hydrolysis. I could write the same mechanism for making an ester. If I wanted to do that, I would say acid chloride plus alcohol. First step in the mechanism is for the alcohol to come in and attack the carbonyl. I'm going to form an O minus. Again, my whole acid adds to make that. The reason I think people like the having the O minus now come down and kick off the chlorine is because it's just one step. So it's less writing, although it's not. Because now what I'm going to make is now I'm going to make my protonated ester, so I've lost my Cl minus, and then I'm going to lose my H plus. make my ester. I think you're putting too many steps together at that point. I think that's, that's too many steps. So your choices are to do it this way or to transfer the proton and then lose the H plus and the chloride at the same time. And it's the same number of steps. It's two steps either way. So could I ask you this mechanism? Sure. But it's not it's pretty straightforward. So coming over here. We can convert this acid chloride into any one of these species down below by that mechanism. React it with, typically I would react it with this species. The O minus C double bond O would come in, attack the carbonyl, the chloride would leave, and you'd make the anhydride. This is called a carboxylic acid anhydride. React it with water, and you make the alcohol, or the carboxylic acid. React it with alcohol, you make the ester. React it with an amine, you make the amide. Same mechanism. So chlorides can be used to make all the species below it in this chart. And actually, that's what happens. You can always make something below you on this chart. You can't make anything above you. So all the acid chloride reactions are pretty much adding either the neutral molecules or the anions of all of those groups. So you can react them all and you can make every compound below you. Same mechanism for each. So acid chlorides are useful, but the mechanisms are all pretty much the same. So you could certainly create a chart they do in the book where they take the acid chloride and they say, okay, I'm going to react this with water. What am I going to make? A carboxylic acid. I'm going to react the acid chloride with 
a carboxylic acid and what am I going to make? I'm going to make the anhydride. I'm going to react an acid chloride with alcohol. What am I going to make? An ester. I'm going to react the acid chloride with a nitrogen species. What am I going to make? the amide. So in chapter 25, they have these sequence of reactions. And so all of these are basically what are called acyl substitutions. Now what they're missing is, they're missing the hydride reductions and they're missing the Grignards. Well, we can do that. We can do the Grignards and the uh, lithium aluminum hydrides. So let's do that. Uh, let's do lithium aluminum hydride first. And lithium aluminum hydride is probably overkill for this. Sodium borohydride would be a little bit more moderate, but the mechanism is going to be the same and the products are going to be the same. So lithium aluminum hydride is a source of H minus. Um, how many H minuses do I have? Up to four. All right, what's the first H minus going to do? There's no, there's, this is not an alcohol. That was yesterday. This is a chloride. So there's no OH to deprotonate. So the H minus is just going to do what? It's going to attack the carbonyl, which is exactly what you said, will happen at the end. So it's going to attack the carbonyl. What happens next? The what? The CL will leave and, well, the CL will leave as a result of, you were pointing it out. Okay. So the O minus will create the double bond and kick off the chlorine. And so then my first H minus is I'm going to end up forming an aldehyde. So H minus number one. Do I have another H minus? Mm -hmm. And will it react with an aldehyde? Mm -hmm. So what's the second H minus going to do? Attack the carbonyl. And I'm going to end up with that. What happens next?
Right. I, right. Nothing happens. Right. I can't bring down the O minus. I can't form a carbonyl because nothing's a leaving group, so it just hangs out and it waits to be protonated by the H plus H2O step. So then we dump in H plus H2O, and what do I make? I make an alcohol. What kind of alcohol? Primary alcohol. So when you reduce an acid chloride down to a primary alcohol. What ester part? Because an aldehyde is easily reduced by an H minus. So once you, re once you make the aldehyde, then it's automatically reduced by the H minus. So it can't stop. Not when there's four, not when there's four H minuses. But that's a good question. If I turn it around, because then I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it around and I'm gonna say, okay, I want to stop at the aldehyde. So what should I do? I want to stop at the aldehyde, so what should I do? Well, the easiest question is don't use four H minuses. Use one H minus. Is there a reagent that has only one H minus? Yes. It is called lithium tritersbutoxy aluminum hydride. So replace three of the H's, H minuses, with tersbutoxides. If I do that, now how many H minuses do I have? Just one. So now, as the H minus adds, I'm going to end up adding that one H minus. The pair of electrons is going to come down, kick off the chlorine, and I've got an aldehyde, and now that aldehyde, there's no more H minuses to react, so voila, aldehyde. The book probably also talks about other reagents that are less reducing. Um, one of them would be called dibal. which is the same approach. But I like the lithium tritersbutoxy aluminum hydride because it's something we could come up with and say, oh, just don't use 4H minuses. That's a good reagent because it has just one. So we could stop there if we wanted to. It could accept, it could accept this. When I put the three oxygens on the aluminum, it makes this less reactive. And so if I can make it less reactive so it really won't react with an aldehyde, that's, that's what it does. So it's not only the stoichiometry, and you're right, you could say, well, what happens if there's still a lithium tritersbutoxy aluminum hydride around? Could it add to the aldehyde? And the answer is actually no. That reagent is less reactive, and so it can only really reduce the acid chloride. So it won't react with the aldehyde. But that's a good point. Because we encountered that 
in my in the next reaction, which would be okay. And notice there's a there's a structure to this, right? I'm trying to organize this as best I can. So we know what we can do with H minuses. What do you think the next thing I'd want to add is? Nobody psychic enough to guess what I'm going to do next? Uh, no, I was thinking reagent. I just added an H minus. What's similar to an H minus, and they usually went together? And. R minus? In other words, do Grignards? Usually we did Grignards first and then we did H minus second, but everything we could do with a Grignard, we could do with an H minus. I think we're in the last two weeks of class. But remember, you can't completely tune me out until after the final exam. Right. Even though you're crawling towards the finish line on the marathon, you still have to finish. So let's do R minus. Acid chloride plus We'll make it simple. CH3 MGBR plus or CH3 Li plus. How many of those do I need? Two. I'm going to react the acid chloride with two of those. What am I going to get? Tertiary alcohol. No, it's either or. It's either either Grignard or organometallic. It's either Grignard or lithium. But two equivalents of either one. Do we agree tertiary alcohol? Yes, no. It's like when I send an email out to my to the chemistry faculty wanting input and nobody email, emails me back and then they get upset because you didn't ask me for input yes I sent out an email and you didn't respond to it I have no recourse against them I have a little bit of recourse against you. So, tertiary, yes, no. I don't know. I don't know. I'm lost. I'm sure some one per, at least one person out there is with me lost. So, what am I going to do? First step in the mechanism. CH3 minus is going to do what? 
Attack the carbonyl. Which will lead to losing the chloride, but not in one step. Okay, I just did that. What happens next? The double bond gets formed and the chloride leaves. So now I made my ketone. And at this point, what Nell said earlier about, well, could we have some Grignard react with the ketone, so we'd form maybe some ketone, but then we'd also form some tertiary alcohol is true. So I'm just going to add two equivalents all the way across the board. So what happens with the second equivalent of CH3 minus? What does it do? Tax the carbonyl. I mean, this is, te this is getting tedious. And I know you're like, stop, but I will stop when I feel comfortable that everybody isn't looking at me like, I don't know what's going on. I can't help looking at me like, just stop, because we still have two and a half more class periods left. Can't stop. Okay. So then the second equivalent comes in, we form our tertiary alkoxide. What happens next? Nothing, because it's got to hang out and wait till it gets protonated. Final step, protonation with H plus H2O, and so if you go back and look in your notes, back to when we first did Grignard's, what you'll find is that if we used an ester or an acid chloride, we used two equivalents of Grignard because we made a tertiary alcohol where two of the groups were the same. I know that's in there. Why? Because this is the mechanism. So, Grignard's, H minus, plus acid chloride, two equivalents are going to add, and we're going to go all the way down to, well, we're going to add the two groups. For H minus, we're going to go form a primary alcohol. For Grignard's, we're going to form a tertiary alcohol. Just two H's versus two, two R's. Okay. What's my next question going to be? Or what's our next reaction going to be? Not yet. When we did the lithium aluminum hydride, what do we do next? When we added lithium aluminum hydride, how many H minuses did we add? Two. What was the next thing we did? We modified the reagent so that I would just add one. How do you stop the aldehyde? So anybody want to know how to stop at the ketone? Well, whether you do or not. So what's our general methodology here? Our general methodology would be to use reagent with just UNO CH3 minus. That would be one way to accomplish this. Well, the problem is they all have one CH3 minus. And if I just add one Grignard or one organolithium, I'm going to get a mess of products. Because if the ketones formed while there's still Grignard present, I'm going to get tertiary and Grignard and some unreacted acid chloride. So the other thing was that the lithium tritersbutoxy aluminum hydride also was a toned down reagent. It was less reactive. And so that's the approach I want to take. I want to use a less reactive organometallic reagent. 
Fortunately, I have that. I have those. And that's the cuprates. So one of the things that you're going to have to remember is that Grignard's and organolithium compounds are much more reactive than cuprates are. Okay? The cuprate is less reactive. And I wouldn't be saying this if this is the only time we were going to use it. But we're going to use it again. So you can conserve a little bit in your memory by putting that one statement in there. Cuprates will always be less reactive than organolithiums and grignards. And so if you react the cuprate with an acid chloride, you just end up adding one methyl, and so you end up forming then the ketone. So you don't reduce it all the way, or you don't react it all the way. You stop at a ketone. So acid chlorides then plus cuprates are going to give me a ketone. I just add one, one methyl group. So it's less reactive. And at this point, I should probably go back to the last chapter because I did leave one part out that fits in with this motif, this idea of Grignards, organolithium, very reactive. Cuprates, less reactive. And that is these molecules that we're going to talk about on Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. Probably Tuesday that are called alpha-beta unsaturated aldehydes and ketones. The alpha and the beta terminology changes when we go to carbonyls. The alpha is now the carbon next to the carbonyl, and then we go beta, gamma, delta, on down the line. This reagent will react differently. This aldehyde will react differently with a Grignard and with a cuprate. So let's do lithium first, or lithium and Grignard. So if I react this with methyl lithium, that being the harsher reagent, the harder reagent, the more reactive reagent, that comes in and adds directly to the carbonyl. So I end up adding the methyl group to the carbonyl to form the alkoxide. And then I'm going to protonate that to form the tertiary alcohol. Yeah. So this is the car this is a CH group. Which one's CH? This is CH. That's just a hydrogen, it's an aldehyde. But the idea is that the Grignard reacted with the carbonyl. Now what happens with a cuprate? Obviously a different reaction. 
because if it's just one reaction, if it was the same reaction, then we w I wouldn't make a big deal about it. So if I add a CH3 from the Grignard, the Grignard, the CH3 minus is going to react at a different position. And so here's what's going to happen in this case. And I'm going to just basically write this as a CH3 minus. And then you, then you would say, well, how come that CH3 minus, if they're the same, they're not the same CH3 minus. One is a lithium and one's a cuprate. The cuprate, the copper changes the reactivity of the methyl group. How is beyond the scope of this course? But when a methyl is paired up in a, in a, in a, in a lithium cuprate or a Gilman reagent, what happens is it attacks this carbon of the double bond, the beta carbon. Then this pair of electrons moves here, and then that pair of electrons moves out to the oxygen. And so I now ended up with my methyl group on the beta carbon, and I end up with this. And this is what's called conjugate addition. Now, I formed this alkoxide. It's not actually an alkoxide. I'll give it a proper name in a moment. I go ahead and add my H+. Plus, and what do I end up with? And Poxide's triangle. And this is called, because this is going to be the topic for the beginning of two, or the beginning of, or maybe Monday, but definitely all day Tuesday. This is a deprotonated enol. You might say, well, that's called an enol oxide. <laughs> Actually, there's two ways we can tell something is a negative charge, either as an oxide or as an eight. So this is called an enolate, because it's a deprotonated you know. And then my next question would be, are enols stable? No, what do they do? They tautomerize to form, in this case, an aldehyde. Now we're back to day one of this semester. So this is called conjugate addition. Cuprates are less reactive and so they add to the beta carbon. And so basically instead of alkylating the carbonyl, they alkylate the beta carbon so that you end up adding now the alkyl group there. And that is different than directly alkylating or directly adding to the carbonyl. So, so that's good. 
So you had a deja vu moment where this kind of looked like it would be 1 2 or 1 4 edition. Right? Sort of. Giving you the benefit of the doubt. I mean, you made a similarity between them, and that's actually, that's actually true. But when we did 1 2 and 1 4 edition, we actually added the H plus first, not the nucleophile. So this would actually, um, this, in the end, where did, where did the groups end up? In the end, they actually ended up sort of in a 1 2 edition. So sometimes this can be called 1 2 conjugate edition. But wait, you added the methyl group and then the hydrogen to the one and the four positions, but then it rearranged. Yeah, I know. At the end, they ended up one, two. So we usually just leave the numbers off and say conjugate addition. But yes, there is sort of a similarity between one, one, two, one, four, and conjugate addition. But the mechanisms have to be different because I'm using a nucleophile and not a electrophile. So why am I throwing this in? This was in the last chapter. Why am I throwing it in? Not so much I forgot about it, but because I want to put it in here in context to say in the last reaction with an acid chloride, Grignard's went all the way to the tertiary alcohol. We added two of them. Cuprates, less reactive, you only add one. Reacting unsaturated Come on, I'm waiting. With, with alpha beta unsaturated aldehydes and ketones, the, the organolithium adds directly to the carbonyl because it's harsher. <coughs> Mildly reagents do conjugate addition. So you just have to kind of remember that. That's it for acid chlorides. Only three more functional groups to go. Next are anhydrides. I like to take these one at a time. We can do mechanisms with this. Maybe we should just do one. Because they're all going to be the same. How about we do this? Let's do something, let's do a reaction. Let's react an anhydride with a amine. Because I seem to re remember that we could take an amine that's attached to the benzene ring and react it with an anhydride, namely acetic anhydride, and we could convert the NH2 into an amide. That'll be deja vu for some of you. That's step A in the synthesis of benzocaine. But what would my mechanism be? We'll just do it with a generic NR2. So first step in the mechanism. What attacks the carbonyl? Okay, so nitrogen attacks the carbonyl. Does it matter which one? Ideally, I, these are symmetrical. If they were unsymmetrical, if the two R groups were different, 
then I would get two different products. But I use, like to use symmetrical anhydrides. So it comes in, it attacks the carbonyl. Let's use the left one. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to form my O minus. Now I'm going to have my NH plus, NH2 plus. Okay. And then over here I've got my OC double bond. O -O. Right. We could do one of two things here. What would you like to do? reform the double bond. Who's leaving? The carboxylate's going to leave. So when the carboxylate leaves, what do I end up with? And what happens finally? Let's lose an H plus off the N. And we make our anode. So that's just that's just an example of and hydride reacting with an amine to make an amide. If I go back to the original table that I, the original table with the acid chloride at the top, I can convert the acid, the acid anhydride into everything below it. React the anhydride with acid and water, or even water, form the carboxylic acid. React it with an alcohol, make the ester. React it with an, amide, with an amine, make the amide. So everything below the anhydride, I can make by adding that reagent. So this is just one example. If you wanted to do the mechanism of anything else, just replace the amine and put in whatever else you're adding. Water, alcohol, it's going to be the same series of steps. And again, I'm using, I'm using the O minus coming back down instead of transferring the proton. Yeah, this makes it a little easier. Okay, so that's that's what anhydrides do now. I should probably take a moment here to talk about anhydrides. What does that mean? Anhydride means without water. So the way you make an anhydride is you take is you take two carboxylic acids and you react them together with an acid catalyst. And you lose water to form the anhydride. Plus H2O. So the, so the anhydride term comes from the fact that you react two carboxylic acids together, lose water, we make water as a product, and that is what then is the anhydride. The one we commonly use in lab is acetic anhydride because it comes from acetic acid.
does anybody, if you've used acetic acid, pure acetic acid in lab? Because you can go to the grocery store and buy acetic acid in a 5% solution as vinegar. But pure acetic acid is sometimes called glacial acetic acid. Have you ever heard that term? Nope. You even went to the bottle in the lab and picked it up and poured out the acetic acid for part A, and it said right on it, glacial acetic acid. It did. So glacial, glacial means pure, but the reason that it's called glacial is because when you have pure acetic acid with no water in it, it actually freezes at, I don't know, like 15 degrees Celsius. So if you have a really cold lab, your acetic acid will freeze in the bottle, hence the name glacial. What they add to glacial acetic acid is a little bit of the acetic anhydride, so that if some water gets in there, it reacts with the anhydride to make more acetic acid so that you don't get water building up in your acetic acid. So it has usually a touch of anhydride on it. But this is, this is an easier way to make an amide. It's a little bit more environmentally friendly to make an amide than using the acid chloride. So if somebody was going to make an amide in an industrial setting, they would use acetic anhydride. They would not use an acid chloride. Primarily because in a plant, there's no big round bottom. Like, there's no round bottom the size of this room to make, like, a ton of material. In graduate school, somebody went on an interview, and they came back, and they said, actually, there was one company that had a humongous round bottom in their plant. And that's the only thing. No picture, you know, we didn't have we didn't have cell phones to be able to take pictures at the time. So no picture, just that's what I heard. But most times it's done in steel tanks. And so if you make HCL in steel tanks, over the long run the HCL is going to destroy the steel. So acetic acid's okay. Plus this is environmentally friendly because what did I make? I basically made another I made I my leaving group was acetic is going to become acetic acid because this H plus is going to combine with that o, o C double bond OR. So then I combine all that acetic acid up and I can convert it back into anhydride and reuse it. So I don't really lose anything. So I could recycle it if necessary. And that would be environmentally friendly. That would be what we call green chemistry. So it's a better way to make an amide. It's probably a better, it's a better way to make an ester too. Although you couldn't use the esterification, Fisher esterification, but this would be an alternative to that. So all the reactions are the same for anhydrides. And we could go through the Grignards and the organo and the lithium aluminum hydride reactions. And we'll do that after our break. Because basically I'm just gonna ask you, okay, if I use lithium aluminum hydride, what am I gonna get? If I use two equivalents of Grignard, what am I gonna get? And the answer is the same thing that we got for acid chlorides. So that's what the organometallics are going to do. Okay, so let's take our five-minute break. We'll start back up again at 35, at uh, 10.35, 25 till. Now we're basically down to two functional groups left. Okay.
Okay, so if I go all the way back to the chart again, anhydrides now, we can convert an anhydride to carboxylic acid using water. We can convert it to an ester using alcohol. We can convert it to an amide using an amine just like we just did. So again, anything below, you can make from anything above it. So acid chloride and, and anhydride, they're both, react, they're both reactions where you, you don't need acid, you just need water to make them convert to the carboxylic acid. But if you want to convert an ester or an amide to a carboxylic acid by doing hydrolysis, you need to use either acid or base. Okay, so carboxylic acids in this chapter, the carboxylic acids are the products. In the last chapter, we talked about their reactions. So now what we're going to do is we're going to jump to esters. So we have an ester. We know how to make esters. Three ways now. We can make an ester by our traditional, by the traditional Fischer esterification, by using H plus H2O, which will be an equilibrium reaction. You need sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid as your acid catalyst for this reaction. And so you can make the esters that way. You can also make an ester by taking an acid chloride and reacting it with the S with the alcohol, that will make you an ester without the equilibrium, but now with the problem of having to make the acid chloride to begin with. And now we just learned a few minutes ago that we could take an acid chlor or an acid anhydride and now react it with an alcohol, and that will form the ester plus then you'll end up with some carboxylic acid once it is the leaving group. So we can make an ester using Fischer esterification, which is the first one. By using an acid chloride or anhydride. So we could go through and we could do the we can do the mechanism of forming um, the ester by Fischer esterification. So let's do that. I'm going to take my carboxylic acid, react my alcohol with it. I'm going to use acid as my catalyst. First question. Because again, this is getting tedious. First step in the mechanism. Acid plus oxygen species. First step in the mechanism. What have I said over and over again? Protonate the oxygen. Which oxygen? Carbonyl. Do I have to do that? Yes. I have no choice. Why do I have no choice? Because alcohol is a nucleophile, but it's not strong enough to add to the carbonyl. I need help from the acid. All right, next step. Alcohol is going to attack the carbonyl. 
These are all equilibrium reactions. Yes. Okay, next. I'm going to lose the H plus. You might say, well, you know, you've been doing this. You've been taking this pair of electrons and moving down here and kicking off that group. Right? That's what I have been doing. Is that going to work here? Here's a hint. If it did, I would have. I, that's what I would have done. But why won't that work? OH is not a good leaving group. Now, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna use it as a leaving group here in a minute. But it is not a good leaving group. What's a better leaving group? Or how do I make it leave? Protonate it. So I got to lose the proton off the OR so that now I can take that proton and I can now protonate that OH. You could also, could, could you protonate the top OH? Sure. Protonate and OH. So if I do that, uh, I wouldn't look kindly upon it. Like have this OH grab the H plus have this OH grab the H plus from that. Yeah, that's not really gonna happen. So let's not let's not write mechanisms with stuff that doesn't happen. Or that isn't plausible. That's probably not plausible. So let's just lose the H plus and now let's protonate one of the OHs. Alright, now what happens? Now I got a choice of steps. I can do this in one step, or I can do it in two. If I do it in one step, which I'm sure everybody will say, let's do it in one step, I could lose this H plus and I could lose the water at the same time. And so if I did that, then I would make my carbonyl and my OR group and I would lose my acid and my H2O. So the acid's a catalyst, so I'm regenerating it. If you don't like that, lose the water first, make a plus charge there, then lose the H+. Plus. So we did this earlier. So that is the mechanism of Fischer esterification. So, again, is there anything really new there? No, not really. Again, is it tedious? Yes. Is it the same thing over and over again? Yes. So that's one thing we can do with esters is we can, or one thing we can do, um, how do we make esters? This is the mechanism for doing Fischer esterification. So we can make them. So now what can we do with them? Well, since esters are now number three or number four, I guess, on our chart, all we can do is turn them into amides. But we can actually turn them into other esters. So So yes so yesterday I kind of talked I kind of brought up the idea of like making biodiesel 
from fatty acids. And you can do that, I guess people are, some people are into algae. If you've ever heard about people are, basically you can grow the algae and then you can get their fatty acids out of them and turn them into biodiesel. People are working on that as a way to get biodiesel. So they just, they can grow the algae. Normally we don't want to grow algae, but in this case we do, right? We don't want to grow algae in Lake Erie or we can't drink the water which is now a big deal, or becoming a big deal over here, instead of Toledo, but I don't, it's still not an issue here yet. Could be in the future. Um, so people are using algae to try and make these amino acids, they're trying to make the fatty acids, but a better way to make, the better way to make biodiesel would be to take and take a triglyceride so this is glycerol and in fats and oils the triglycerol or the triglyceride is something with three fatty acids attached to the glycerol molecule and so that will be my long chain 16, 18, 20 carbons, etc. So this is a triglyceride. Right? And in biology, that's a fat oil. A, a, uh, if you put phosphorus groups here, you make a, a phospholipid. I think phospholipids can be used for cell walls. So it's just a question of what this group is, but this is a fatty acid. If it's a straight chain with no double bonds, it's a saturated fatty acid. If it's a double bond, it's, a, it's unsaturated. If it's a mix, it's a mix. If you try and convert the double bond to a single bond and you don't go all the way, you, put, you make a partially saturated fatty acid. So this is where our fatty acids typically come from. They come from fats and oils, which have this structure as a triglyceride. Fat's a solid, oil's a liquid. So we take our fatty acid, and if I want to make biodiesel out of it directly, what I do is I treat this with methanol, an acid, or base, but we'll talk about acid. So if I react a carboxylic, or if, sorry, if I react an ester with an alcohol, what I do is called transesterification. I convert or I replace or substitute what the alcohol that's on the ester originally with a new one. And so in this case, if I react it with at least three moles of methanol, what I'll end up doing is forming three moles of now fatty acid methyl ester and glycerol. So this is a transesterification reaction. So that's one of its useful, useful features is that if I want to make my own biodiesel, or if, heaven forbid, somebody at the university wanted to make biodiesel. And unfortunately, when they call the chemistry department now, they're going to get my office. And they're going to say, hey, can you make us some biodiesel? And when they've asked that question before, I've said no. Usually with something before it, or bad word before it. Because that's the last thing I need to do is to set up my own biodiesel plant in the basement. Like I said, Loyola Chicago, they, they do that. They take all their used cooking oil and they convert it to soap and biodiesel. And just hearing the paperwork they had to go through in order to do that. Yeah, I'm not doing paperwork. I don't want to do paperwork in lab when somebody cuts themselves, bless you. So I don't want to do biodiesel paperwork. But if I did, this is the reaction I would use. I would use methanol with 
and with the ester with a fat or an oil, I would replace the OR group with now methyl alcohol. And if this really gets popular, the government's going to step in and ask for regulations. There's, there's nothing they're not going to regulate, right? You want your medicinal things, they're going to regulate it. They're going to regulate it like a regular crop. So we're going to look for pesticides, we're going to look for strength. There's a whole division of analytical instruments that are being sold and made just to analyze medicinal things that are fully legal in some states and not fully legal in the state of Ohio. But if that ever happens, that's what they're going to be doing is looking at all sorts of things in there. Well, if you ever get the biodiesel, we're going to have to make sure there's no methanol in the biodiesel because methanol will give it a, a lower flash point so the tank that you're storing it in could explode. Um, glycerol's not good on the engine. Glycerol's great for your hands. So I'll talk about soaps here in a moment. Great for the hands, lousy for car engines. So you have to make sure that you get those two products out of your biodiesel before you put it in your car. Because otherwise it'll destroy your engine or explode, one or two. There's too much methanol in it. So that's an example of transesterification. Our standard transesterification reaction would be to take an ester with one alcohol portion, react it with a second alcohol in the presence of acid, and we will convert or we will substitute the OR group of the alcohol for the OR group that was originally in the ester. So this is transesterification. In order to really make this work, you need, because this is an equilibrium reaction, we use an excess of the alcohol that we're substituting. Why? Well, without going through the mechanism, the full mechanism, which you can do on your own time, I'm going to end up with this. Right, this this is the key this is the key species where I've got both alcohols where I've got both alcohols attached to carbon. So you might say what's going to differentiate between losing R1 and losing R2? If I use a large excess of R2, then what's going to happen is if I lose R2 then when I make that ester, it's going to react with the acid and I'm going to put R2 right back on again. If I lose R1, then even if I make that ester, I'm going to put another R2 on it, so eventually everything gets driven to R2 simply because there's more R2 alcohol than there is R1 alcohol. So we're using Le Chatelier's principle to push the equilibrium towards the formation of that product. So if we're making biodiesel, by definition, we have to use excess methanol. We just have to make sure we get it out in the end. That comes and goes depending on the price of gas. So right now, research into biodiesel primarily from algaes. Um, and if the gas prices go up to $4, a gallon, there'll be more emphasis on, you'll see about algae making biodiesel everywhere. It'll become popular again. Okay, so that's transesterification. So actually, that's not even, that's the chart, that's one ester going to another ester. That's like horizontal. 
You want to make an amid? It's all going to boil down to leaving group. So I'm going to add my acid. Actually, actually, I'm not going to add acid. If I do the reaction this way and I have acid present, what's the acid going to do? What's the acid's role? Acid protonates stuff. So who's going to protonate, the N or the O? Who's more basic, N or O? N. So if I have acid in this reaction, it's going to protonate my N. My N is no longer a nucleophile, and my reaction is done. So no acid. So if nitrogen then is a, ba is a better base, what, it makes it a better nucleophile. So nitrogen is going to come in and attack the ester on its own. Why can it do that? It's a better nucleophile. So now I'm going to end up with this. I want to, in my next step, do the proton transfer, is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a proton transfer. Now, the tough thing about this reaction is we would normally say, okay, let's make OR leave. Yeah, it's not leaving. Why is it not leaving? Because OR is a pretty bad leaving group because it's a strong base. So what would I like to do to make it leave? Make it a weak base by... How do we make OH leave? Protonating it. I have no I have no extra H plus. Because if I had if I had extra H plus, it would have reacted with the nitrogen and killed it. So in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to invoke heat. So I'm probably going to have to do some heat with this reaction. And the heat's going to then cause this reaction to occur. So then I'm going to form the carbonyl with the amid, and then I'm going to form the alcohol. And I know that doesn't look satisfying because you're like, so heat can make OR leave? Heat made OH leave when we were making enamines and imines, so I guess it can make OH leave with an H plus to form the carbonyl. But I'm probably going to have to apply a little bit of heat to this. Of course, you could say, why isn't the nitrogen going to leave? Why won't the heat make the nitrogen leave? Well, the periodic table says oxygen. Although OR is a la is not a great leaving group, it's not a horrible leaving group like nitrogen would be, because nitrogen is next to it on the periodic table. So your choice between OR leaving and NH leaving, OR. Am I going to have to force it? Yeah, I'm going to have to add a little heat to it. So if I want to go from ester to amide, which is number four to number five, this is how I'm going to have to do it. But it'll work. Just might take a little heat. And no matter if the, if the, and then this, then the alcohol isn't strong enough to attack the carbonyl without acid. 
and there is no extra. So that stops it then. Okay. So that's how we can make an anode. The ester hydrolysis is interesting. That's eh, not that interesting. It's sort of interesting. It has a practical purpose as well. Uh, typically, we can do this hydrolysis with either acid and water, or we could use base and water. Kind of focus on the base and water because that one's a little bit different. Back to our fats and oils, our triglycerides. What can you do with triglycerides? You can treat them with hydroxide base. Typically it was done with potassium hydroxide. Where did the potassium hydroxide come from? It came from ash. So you burn your wood, you take your ash, you mix it with some fats, you boil it, you, that basically does hydrolysis. We end up with our glycerol, and we end up now, because the solution is basic, we end up with deprotonated fatty acids. For nearly, you know, for time and eternity, this reaction's been used to make so, okay. so if you're like stuck on an island somewhere, like Gilligan's Island, you're too young for that. But if you get stuck somewhere and you need soap, find some fat. I suppose you could get away with algae too. Find some fat, burn some wood, take the ash, mix it together, soap. So this is a classic experiment to make soap. This is how people make their handmade, handcrafted soaps. Right. All natural soaps. They just use hydroxide, an oil or a fat, coconut oil, vegetable oil, lard, whatever you want. Mix it, you'll make the soap. Remember soap, hydrophilic end, hydrophobic end, that's how soap works. Little essential oil here for fragrance, and you have a handmade soap. Right, sell it on Etsy or wherever you sell it. And one of my one of my uh, one of my former research students is that her mother was into the essential oil, and then she branched off into like soap making, like a soap making workshop that you could take like kids to and they could make their own soaps and choose what soaps they wanted to make and what fragrances they wanted. So it fit right in. And we used to do it with the kids in chemistry camp. So this is a way to make soap. But it's this reaction, this base hydrolysis is called saponification. And while it's not directly soap in the name, it's close. So this is saponification. This is how we can make this is how we can make um, soaps. Now, what's the mechanism of this? Because the mechanism is kind of interesting. I'm going to take my ester and I'm going to react it with hydroxide. First step. have OK, 
Okay, anything to deprotonate? Hydroxide then. Attack. Attack the carbonyl. What have we been doing for the last couple of days? If it didn't deprotonate first. Right? So if it doesn't, if there's nothing there to deprotonate, have your nucleophile attack. What if my nucleophile's too weak to attack? Hopefully there's acid there to protonate, then attack. Okay, that's great. So here I am at my O minus species that I've been at 5,000 times before. I, mean, I wasn't lying when this is tedious. But now this is a little, this reaction is going to be a little bit different. Because I'm going to try and bring my O minus back down to form the carbonyl, and who's going to leave? The OH is going to leave, so I'm going to go backwards. But wait, I'm not going forwards. Well, one of the things you find out if you want to do the saponification reaction, we need a little heat. But that little heat is going to do what? Ah, the OR group might leave. That OR group might lead one every 10,000 times. I'll just make up a number. And I just, that is a made up number. So every 9,999 times I'm going backwards. But one time, I'm going to lose my OR group, primarily because of the heat. But that's all it takes. Because what's going to happen next? When I lose my OR minus group and I make my carboxylic acid, I now have a carboxylic acid group plus my OR minus group, and what's going to happen now? My RO minus is going to, it's going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid, so now I'm going to make a carboxylate and alcohol. Now, you can put in here equilibrium reactions to go back and forth between the OH leaving and the OR leaving, but this step right here, no equilibrium reaction. It is 100% complete because a carboxylate is not a strong enough base to deprotonate an alcohol. So once you form, once an OR minus is kicked out, it's going to immediately protonate or deprotonate the carboxylic acid and form that product, and that's it. You're done. So eventually, over time, what's going to happen? You're going to end up with a 100% reaction. Because even though you're going to spend your time going back and forth between the OH adding and leaving, Every time you, an OR leaves, it leads to product and there's no reversibility. So typically, like when we made soap with the kitties, we would put it in the big beaker and we would heat it and sort of boil it for an hour or so. And then let it cool and then wash all of the lye, all of the base out of it. Because if you leave lye in there, then you go to wash your hands with sodium hydroxide, and that's a little harsh. So it just takes heat, and it's this step, it's that final step that drives the equilibrium. So any kind of ester hydrolysis is an issue. Um, we have to be careful with that. Yesterday, in lab, people were distilling their esters that they had made by Fisher esterification. And so they put in their round bottom and they were going to distill it. In previous springs, we've tried to use a hot plate to distill it, and the hot plate wasn't hot enough. So it would just sit there and reflux. That was never a good thing to have the ester sit there and reflux in the presence of acid and water because it could have reversed itself. 
course, actually all it did was set up an equilibrium. But you want to make sure that if you make an ester, you don't touch, it doesn't touch acid and water, base and water. Because if it does, it can decompose and go back to the carboxylic acid. And so if you ever would have a situation where you would have rancid soap, or soap that doesn't smell really good, it might be because um, you, made, you made some sort of, a, or actually most likely it would be a rancid ester. Because then you're making the carboxylic acids, which usually reek. So you've got to keep them away from acids and bases. Right. So that's pontification. Not really, I mean, esters, there's, there's a lot we can do with esters, um, but not that much. You can hydrolyze them, you can transesterify them, and you can make gametes out of them. And they're second to last on the list. We can reduce them. I don't feel like a broken record. Lithium aluminum hydride is a source of H minus. How many? Up to four. What happens here? I'm going to make that species. What's going to happen next? Well, if I apply enough heat to this, I'm going to bring this pair of electrons and kick off the OR group. I've now stepped into the world of making OR group a leaving group by heating it. So might as well do it here. So I lost an OR group, which is going to protonate to become the alcohol. I got an aldehyde sitting here. What's the second H minus going to do? Attack it. So when we reduce an ester, because of this step, the ester is going to cleave apart. And so I'm going to end up with a primary alcohol from the carboxylic acid side, and I'm going to end up with the alcohol from the alcohol side of the ester. So pure lithium aluminum hydride is going to reduce this down to primary alcohol plus other alcohol. Okay, this is a unique reaction because it's going to split in half. And yeah, and in, in here would be a then H plus H2O at the end. I'm kind of skipping through the reaction. This is not a 10 out of 10 mechanism because I'm skipping some steps. well, I'm not grading myself, so if I was grading myself, it would probably be a 6 out of 10. So, my last question. Which I've done, which I've asked two times today. I just reacted two H minuses. What would I like to do now? One H minus, thank you. I want to add one H minus to my ester. Okay, what am I going to use? Li. 
tritersbutoxy aluminum hydride. That's our source of 1H. Okay. That H minus is going to come in, add to the ester so that I'm going to end up with this. And then because there's only one H minus, I'm done with this part. So then I'm going to add my H plus H2O to this. And what am I going to make? That. What is that? A. Am I acetal? So with this 1H minus, I'm going to make a hemiacetal. Anybody psychic enough to know my next question? Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, we know how to make a full acetal at H plus in another alcohol. But in this case, I've got this hemiacetal in acidic, in acid water conditions. My next question would be, is it stable. Is this stable? Is it a special hemiacetal? No. Is it stable? No. I have a, I have a, I have a deja vu feeling that I, that 24 hours ago exactly we were right here at this point. Only we had a hydrate instead of a hemiacetal. And I had asked the same question. Is the hydrate stable? Is it a special hydrate? No, not stable. So then I would say, okay, what's going to happen to this? It's going to go backwards to a... Yes, thank you, an aldehyde. Why is it going back to the aldehyde? Because I'll even bring up my little pens with my highlighter and say the reason this is a hemi is because it's an OH and an OR. That's what makes it a hemi. Two OHs, hydrate. Two ORs, full-blown whatever. OHOR, hemi. Where did that hemi come from? One R, one H, it came from an aldehyde. So one H minus with an ester is going to take it all the way back to an aldehyde. So what we have left, so what we have left with the esters is Grignards. And we know Grignards will add two equivalents. And then I'll say, and this will be start starting after the exam on Monday, you won't remember this, but I will. We'll add two alkyl groups with the Grignard, and we'll end up forming a tertiary alcohol because that's what esters and Grignards do. C, chapter, whatever. And then I'll say, I want to add just one alkyl group. You will not remember to say cuprate. And then the cuprate will allow us to actually convert this into an ketone. Okay. 
All right, today I will put, um, tonight I will put together sort of a, I guess I will continue to put together a list of reactions that we've talked about. I will mark the ones that you should be able to do mechanisms for, and that will be the, that will be for Monday. If you have any questions, you can email me. Um, the problems, the extra, the extra exam points, just take a picture of your, or scan, whatever you got. Take a picture of that, send it to me, I'll grade it and send it back to you um, on the computer. But if you have any questions, um, ask.